stream. So they were down in the stream collecting. And this policeman appeared over the hill and came walking towards him. And, you know, this Hi, I'm David Gregg, director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. This video is the second one to come out of the Bees of Rhode Island Research Symposium that we hosted October 5, 2022. This features a talk by Julia Vieira, who's been part of a student research team coordinated by Professor Steve Alm, who we heard from in the last symposium video. The team is doing amazing work on some specific bee topics, but they're also turning up all kinds of interesting observations that are surely going to feature in additional research in coming months and years. So let's see what Julia's discovered about the relationships between bumblebees and clover. So hello again, I'm Julia. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you today about our work with bumblebees, my project related to bumblebee floral preferences and clover. And before we get into that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our former grad student, Liz Varconi's thesis work, because her work is what really heavily inspired my research. So this is only going to be a little snip of her research. If you want more of it, it will be published soon. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to send you to the journal when the time comes. But uh, to start off, when Liz was starting her research in 2019, we knew through Zach Scott, Stephen Sapolsky, other students, that we had historically 11 species of bumblebees in Rhode Island. This was based off of URI's own insect collection and a few other collections at nearby museums, I think like the Smithsonian and other things that Liz could get a hand on. <laughs> Um, as well as she also verified by looking at like Discover Life uh, publications to see what bees are historically present in the state. So basically these 11, we're pretty sure this is the 11 that we had historically. But then when she started surveying, we could only find six. And so she, her question was, are, do we really only have these six, or are there some that we're not seeing in the projects that we're working on with other students? And so for her project, she had two main objectives. The first was to examine the current relative abundance and diversity of the bumblebee species in the state, and to identify the flowers that are visited by each of the species that we're finding. And so we had a few different survey methods, the first of which, of course, we used the blue bee vein traps because we know these are very good at collecting bees. So we had 54 sites where we would deploy these traps, and they were a variety of sites, including farms, golf courses, and residential areas. We would set out the traps for only three days at a time, and then we would take them down, bring them back, ID all of these, pin them for our collections. And this was repeated six times throughout the season from like May to September. And all of these traps were placed near flowering vegetation or along tree lines where we thought the bees would be visiting the flowers or potentially nesting along the tree lines. And then our second floral, uh, our survey method were floral observations. And so bringing it back to what David Gregg said er earlier, how about we actually get in the field and just see the bees and <laughs> see what they're doing? And so we had 48 sites where we basically just picked them because they had abundant floral resources and we would follow like transects along uh, floral, florally abundant areas. We would identify the, the bumblebees that were foraging on these plants by eye we did that using a USFS Eastern Guide to Bumblebees uh, that we learned by heart. <laughs> um, and obviously, you guys probably know, it's pretty easy to identify bumblebees because of the coloration. So it was a very good subject for us to be able to just identify them in the field. Um, and we also wanted to note that we only surveyed the flower patches once per visit, so if we walked by, we never walked by it again, <laughs> and we wouldn't, to try and reduce double counting. And this is just a map of our survey sites, so all of the blue diamonds were where we put up our traps, 
All of the red spots were where we had our floral surveys, where we just did informal observations in the field. And I feel like we had a pretty good sampling where we got, we're able to get a lot of the state. So I'm pretty happy with what all the work that went into this. And lastly, we also did pollen analysis on some of the bees. So we removed pollen pellets. You can see this big old pollen pellet here on one of our bees from 31 historical specimen that were dated from 1901 to 1955 as well as nine modern specimen that we collected in the blue vein traps that had good pollen pellets that we could use for this purpose. So they were from 2015 to like Zach Scott's research up until uh, Liz's research. And they were analyzed by Andrea Nurse, who is a palynologist or pollen specialist at the University of Maine. And so these were our results. In total, we observed or collected almost 10,000 bumblebees in the span of three uh, field seasons. Seven of these species were found on 262 plant species. The most abundant, of course, was Bombus and Patience, the common eastern bumblebee, as you can see here. And Bombus and Patience was observed using 212 plant species, so definitely a generalist, mm -hmm. uses basically anything that's around. Um, our, technically, our least abundant was actually Bombus oricomis. Uh, we had one sighting of Bombus oricomis, I think, the summer of 2020. 2021? Okay. Um, yeah, if you are aware of that situation, that one threw us for a loop. <laughs> but basically, we, we tried going back. We weren't able to find it again this field season, but we think that this is a species that has moved into Rhode Island because this wasn't formerly one of the 11 historically present species in the state. But as Dr. Ahn mentioned, uh, we are confident in saying our species of concern is Bombus fervidus. This is one that was historically present, and with Liz's survey, both in the traps and in the field, we are only seeing Bombus fervidus 10 to 20 times a year. And when you compare that to Bombus impatiens and how many impatiens we're seeing in a field season, it's definitely concerning, and that's why we feel confident in saying that this is a species we need to be putting more effort into. And so this was our floral visitation results. And the main thing I want you to take away from here is that we had three plant species, uh, Monarda fistulosa, bee balm, Trifolium pretense, red clover, and Lavandula angustifolia, uh, English lavender. These had the highest species richness or bumblebee diversity. So six of the seven bumblebee species that we saw, we saw using these three plants. And so this was kind of our little recommendation for if you want to support a diversity of bees, these three plants are really, really good. And then on to the pollen types, I'm only going to talk about Bombus fervidus for the point of my research coming up. So historically, the historical samples we did get analyzed for Bombus fervidus, uh, the number one pollen type was cowvetch, but in a very close second place, we're seeing red clover coming up again as the uh, a, an abundant pollen source that they are collecting all the way back in the early 1900s. And then now, in first place was rose pollen, but again, in a very close second place, is still red clover. And so this is our new uh, species list for the state. We have the addition of Bombus oricomis that wasn't here historically, but we have that one sighting, so we know they are in the state now. And then Bombus fervidus, our species of concern. So now moving on to my research, after everything I just told you, we know that red clover seems to be a very important pollinator plant, not only for our other bumblebee species, but especially for Bombus fervidus. And uh, Thompson in 2005 spoke about how floral preferences differ amongst lo local populations. So my objective here isn't to say, hey, clover is important, because a lot of the literature tells us that clover is important to bees. 
I'm just here to say how important is clover to specific species in this region so that we can get a better idea of how we can better improve and improve our conservation efforts for uh, bee species in Rhode Island specifically. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, there's plenty of literature that says there is a high bee abundance and diversity observed on many different clover species. And so this was my site that I started prepping last summer. In July uh, 2021, we seeded this area that we might go out and see later depending on the weather. <laughs> so we're by the apples with 55 pounds of bird sunflower seed as a way to uh, kind of act as like a smother crop, but also it's a very good source of food for the bees and the birds. <laughs> so we did that in summer of last year, rototilled it twice in early spring of 2022, and then on March 14th, Pi Day, <laughs> We seeded, <laughs> and I will never forget it because it was Pi Day. <laughs> so I actually seeded technically four different types of clover, and then a common native self heal. So the white clover I seeded at 10 pounds per acre, medium and mammoth red clover, two cultivars of red clover, I seeded at 20 pounds per acre, crimson clover at 25 pounds per acre, and self heal at six pounds per acre. And this was all just recommendations that I took directly from my seed sources. But um, in, from what I've been able to find, this is actually a very heavy seeding rate. Uh, everything is a lot lighter than that, so I feel like this is actually a very good seeding rate to try and get this as dense as possible with flowers. And then throughout the season, we just did some manual weeding to try and keep the weed level down in the plots, as well as occasional irrigation because we had a lot of drought conditions <laughs> and clover is like water. <laughs> so this is kind of what my plot looked like in this summer. Um, the plot was 40 by 100 feet and I had a total of five treatments so each type of flower had four replications within this plot. Um, I say it kind of looked like this because I had very, very poor self heal germination. So actually, it doesn't look like that. <laughs> if you block that, everything else came in really, really well. <laughs> and so, to kind of get into our methods, I spent a lot of time doing this, where each of us, we had a team of four observers, we would take one replicate at a time and we'd each stand in the plot. And then we'd be in that plot, I'd set a timer for five minutes, and we'd take uh, snap cap clear vials where we could capture any bee that was using a flower, any bee that we could in five minutes. So this was quadrat sampling that I employed here. And after every five minutes, we would ID the bees, we took some data, we'd let the bees go, and then we'd move on to the next. So basically our movement looked like this where we move up the plot sequentially until it was over. So the whole survey period was about like 30 minutes or so, if you include identification time. And so I took a morning and an afternoon survey. Um, the, I was looking for species identification. So bumblebees, we identified two species, of course, because that's easy. Some solitary bees, we also <laughs> could identify the species. Others, only genus, others, only family, but we did the best that we could in the field. Um, I also took down the gender or sex of the bee and the foraging behavior. So as they were on the flower, do we see them nectar foraging, pollen foraging? And then afterwards when we collected it, do we see a pollen load on them? Um, and at the end of the afternoon survey, I would estimate the floral abundance in every single subplot with this little half meter square quadrat. And so in each of these subplots, I took five samples for the floral abundance to get an overall estimate for the subplot versus counting every single clover head in that subplot because that would just take a lot of time. <laughs> 
And so these are my results so far, because you caught me at a bad time where I still haven't analyzed my data <laughs> since the season just ended. But um, interestingly, I was able to get almost 2,000 observations just in this one field season on these flowers. And of course, we saw medium red clover had very high bee diversity, but interestingly, crimson clover also came in as one of the best plants in terms of diversity. So each of these species uh, of clover had 10 species of bees each visiting them. Um, white clover was mostly visited only by honeybees and bombs and patients. So it was very active, but it didn't have a lot of diversity. I have a lot of observations, but yeah. And then again, poor self hill germina germination. I think I was only able to get three observations. <laughs> And the most uh, I had in a plot, I think, were like 18 flower heads. So yeah, it didn't do very well. So in the future, next summer, we are also established another plot on East Farm in five acre field. That's twice the size of this one I surveyed. So I wanna repeat the quadrat surveys to get more data. And I also wanna supplement all of the um, data I was collecting, like the pollen foraging behavior with TDR readings to see how potentially soil moisture may be impacting visitation. And to get even more into that, I'm going to start doing potted experiments in the greenhouse where I can actually look at the effect of drought on clover nectar. The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us, and the people and organizations working to understand and conserve them.